Okay, Brad, so we talked in the last part. So um, you're doing the sport, you're pricing up a cricket match. Now, would you price up that cricket match well in advance of the market on the exchanges going up? Uh, well, originally, obviously, when I first got into sports betting, there, there was no exchange. So um, you could price it up and put the prices up and it didn't make any difference because there was, no one was ringing up straight away to bet six to four because they could lay 11 to eight, it never happened. So obviously things were a lot different there. When I started sports betting, it was a price for Bjorn Borg, a price for Nick Feldo and a price for Eric Bristow. And that was probably, you know, you'd done your sports betting for the year. Um, the, diff the big changes were obviously the internet because this was, you know, pre-internet days when I started doing it. So one of the problems you had was where did you get any information? Where did you find out what the runners were? Where did you get the scores for the overnight golf in America? You know, you get the first half a dozen on teletext the next morning. Um, so actually finding out anything was difficult. And uh, as golf as an example, we used to have to phone the PGA Tour or the European Tour and get them to fax over entries. Um, use the ATP Tour Media Fax Service for um, tennis entries and draws and things like that. So actually just getting any kind of information um, it was, you know, it was pretty difficult. It's, it actually made me laugh recently looking at um, how people were talking about how slow the shot tracker was on PGA Tour and it hadn't updated and, and I thought back to, well, yeah, you used to get an update the day after you'd find out what the scores were sort of thing, you know, literally you'd wait and now people, if you haven't got the scores within five minutes, they're, they're getting upset. So it was difficult to get any sort of information to start with and, for example, on the cricket, cricket would be priced up the test match you'd have top batsmen and the win draw win market as it were and it'd be priced up before the match and then it'd be priced up again at lunch and then again at tea and then at the end of the match and there was no no where do you get your comparison from you know you, you didn't have another firm's prices on your phone or you didn't have uh, betfair or any, you know almost pre-computer so you didn't matter you put the prices up as you saw them and laid the bets and another part to that was you couldn't even see the bets coming in anyway, you know, because there was no like tracker or ticker or recording of the bets. You put the prices up and they were out there. So, you know, you weren't so worried. There must have been occasion in those days where firms totally disagreed and you was, there was an arbing situation available to the punters. Yeah, but arbing wasn't, wasn't, almost wasn't a thing. Well, you know, how did you find out the punter what the price was unless you went into the betting shop or on page... 401 on ITV on the text or whatever and you might get someone that was back in England at six to four with you and you know Pakistan at five to one somewhere else but you know you wouldn't know and it didn't make any difference really you know there was you just had the confidence in your prices and sports betting was such a tiny fraction of the market then compared to what it is now that you know it's a lot easier to get bets on as well. Now you've been in You've been up until recently, very recently. So you've been in the modern situation where there are people trying to nick a few quid Arbor yeah. and stuff. Now, what's the issue that bookmakers have with Arbor? Because if you spent all that time pricing up the cricket and yeah. somebody's trying to nick a few quid off of you because the exchanges disagree slightly, should you really stick to your guns and think, well, that's the price they're wrong and take them on? Or, you know, or is it just the fact that bookies don't like people earning out of them? Um, there's probably a little bit of yes in all of those things um it's let me try and give you an example if say you were pricing up a tennis match between henman and rosetsky and you made it an each or two game you were 10 to 11 each and someone else was one to two henman six to four rosetsky so you you've you're getting filled in on henman at 10 to 11 they're getting filled in on rosetsky at six to four and the match goes two sets all six games all in the fifth set it's, a, it's an each or two match. You, your prices are definitely right. If you priced it again tomorrow, you'd still be each or two. But the guy that you were 10 to 11 on, Henman, ends up winning in the, you know, the end of the fifth set. So you've done all your money because you've laid the 10 to 11. They've done their, they've kept all their money because they've laid the six to four. You've done your money, not because you were wrong, you were right. You've done your money because somebody else was wrong. So there's a little bit of that factor in why you don't want to lay, you know, Arbors, as, it, as you, you know, you'd say, because there's a chance you'd want to lay both sides. You want to lay two-way business, not just one way all the time. If you're ultimately trying to make a book, whether it's on the cricket or the tennis or the 
you don't want to be filled in on one side you want to be you, you never get those books where you get the perfect situation but ideally you want to be in a situation where you've got a balanced book where you've made a book um, and obviously there's a little bit of the as you say bookmakers don't like just having you know their pockets picked by people who to their mind might have you know no skill or no judgment or no I don't I don't mind if someone is taking me on at my price and they're better judged than I am and they win money off me that's fine but you know just to be yeah, you know, there's a little bit of pride in that. You don't want to just be giving money away from someone who's literally picking your pocket. Okay, so that's interesting. So we're talking about sports betting still. So you price the fairly static. All your figures and facts are there. You've priced up this for argument's sake the cricket. Now, if you suddenly see on the exchange a sustained move on one of your prices, do you look to adjust the market or see what news you've missed that must have filtered through? Or do you think, nah, you know, back to the thing, they're wrong, I'm right, let's take a few quid out of this because I think they're, they're betting bad value. Yeah, I think you'd have to, if you want to use cricket as an example, you have to say, what's the match? You know, is this a test match between England and Australia? Where, yeah, I've got an opinion and every bit of news that I think is out there is available to me, whether it's the weather or injury or team news. If you're confident that you've not missed anything and nothing's passed you by and it's a big game, absolutely, yeah. If it's, you know, an IPL game or something like that where you're less confident that the market may perhaps have more inf information than you have, then you wouldn't be taking an opinion. If the market moves, then you're moving because unquestionably the market will know more than you do. So you just have to judge each situation and each the strength of... Um, the market and the strength of the competition that you're betting on is it a test match or is it basildon under 13's cricket league you know you you're making a decision judged on the liquidity and the strength of the market and you're quite happy to be wrong on the test match if you know you thought england were a superior team and you're happy to lay them or you're happy to uh, keep them on side and you're wrong fair enough but you don't you know you can't have as strong an opinion on every single market in every single uh, event okay no Going back to uh, what you, sort of sports trading again, you were in that period, in the thick of it, the big bang, I'll call it, of the exchanges. Now, when I worked on course, it took a fair while for people to start cottoning on to the effect of the betting, uh, the betting exchanges. It did How long did it take for you guys to start taking them seriously from your end? I think sort of, you know, it's not for me to speak as a spokesman for Ladbrokes, but I think... If I'm honest with you, there was such uh, an animosity towards um, Betfair and you know a desire that they weren't going to succeed and that everything would be done to try to um, you know level the playing field as was often uh, the well used hackneyed phrase at the time. Um, they were a bit slow. We were all a bit slow to to accept the power of you know the behemoth that became um, Betfair. For me, as a odds compiler and a punter I think the thing that I'm going to use an analogy that I saw a TV program once on the BBC is a documentary about ticket touts and they were talking about uh, ticket agencies and ticket touts and they said the worst thing that happened to ticket touts was eBay because they bought a ticket for Phantom of the Opera for 25 quid and could knock it out for 100 quid but when eBay came along you could buy it someone could go on there and buy it for 50 quid and I remember the guy saying on this documentary, suddenly everyone knew what the right price was. Everyone knew what the price for a ticket was. And almost that was the case once Betfair came along and became very liquid, that suddenly everyone knew what the right price was. So it made it harder for us, harder for me as a punter at the time, because obviously everyone who's involved in racing as a punter, where I thought I had an edge, where I thought I knew what the price for something should be, and the punters might not, not through any nefarious or skullduggerous kind of thing but because that was my job that was what I was being paid for suddenly everyone knew what the right price was so there was less of an edge as a layer or a, a punter. Now did it take the heat off the bookmakers a bit because all the real shrewdies were now going on the exchanges tucking up the abs absolute mugs on there did it did it for a period you stop getting the really sharp money coming in? I think if you make a mistake the sharp money will still find find its way to you know find its way to you whether that's on the racing or the cricket or the golf or the snooker or the tennis or anything you know I think there are still plenty enough uh, opportunities out there now 
and even more so because bookmakers now obviously are pricing up so many markets and have so many derivative markets that are driven by trading tools and algorithms and uh, robotic programs that you can't be as confident in all of your prices as you might have been if you're the person actually compiling that price. You know, if, I, if I've done it and I say it's five to two, I know it's five to two. But if it's a derived market off of something, you can never be as confident in that. So because whereas you might have had 20 markets on a golf tournament, you now might find you've got 100 markets or, you know, 250 markets on a football match. So while you have to get 250 of them right, as a punter, you only have to find the one that's not right. So there's plenty of opportunities out there and the sharp money, bet fair or not, will still find its way to you if you're the wrong price. So do you think that um, algorithms will eventually take over from odds compilers? Or does there need to be a human touch there to say, hang on, this has got this a bit wrong here? I think one of the problems that punters would say is why they have a lot of difficulty getting on is because of that there are so many markets and so many derivative markets and you can never, as I've said, be as confident in, you know, in all of those prices as you can in the ones that you've done yourself. But if, let me use this as an example. If you had to get on a plane and there were two planes on the runway and they were both going to be flown autopilot and the computer was going to take it off, fly it and land it, one of the planes still had two pilots on just in case and one didn't, which one would you be getting on? You know, I've, it's kind of the same. You, as many robo programs and as many trading algorithms and as many um, tools that you can have, you still need someone there to take it off and land it at the start of the event and at the end of the event and to watch it just in case something goes wrong. So I think that obviously individually you can't provide as many markets as you can if you're using trading tools and that's quite right. You want the best of technology and you want the best um, equipment and the best programs and the best tools that you can have but you still I think need someone who has got that knowledge of the market has who can spot things that might not be quite right who can yeah start it and finish it and make sure it doesn't crash into the mountain I suppose so it's like a perpetual battle you think there's some very clever people on the other side of the exchange using similar software and coming up with you know that decided to be the punter rather than the bookies you, you surprised by how clever the other side is uh, I'm not because I've sort of gone through that period of you know the prehistoric dinosaur type days of how we used to do things with a pencil and paper to seeing how it's done now I, I can see there are when trading teams now and trading firms are looking to employ people into their function no one's everyone wants people with mass degree if you look at any of those kind of trading jobs or jobs within the industry People want quants, people want um, people who are, who are excellent at Excel and have got fantastic um, you know, IT skills. More so, that's a, more of a requirement than someone who's got good bookmaking skills. I hope, you know, for the future, for my future as much as anyone else, is that there is still um, a desire and a need and a requirement for someone who knows the difference between, you know, six to four and 13 to eight kind of thing.